fountain pen on the floor. I hope it doesn't explode. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you for praying for us, for our safe travels. We, uh, we drove over 5,000 miles and uh, did it in two weeks, exactly almost, and uh, uh, had absolutely no trouble. No flat tires, no hailstones, no tornadoes. Uh, God took care of us. Amen. What was amazing? Is, thank you so much. Uh, what was amazing was that uh, we passed through uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas Panhandle, Oklahoma. Stopped in Oklahoma overnight, and the, the following day or night, uh, he thought Oklahoma, just a few miles north of where we were, blew away. And uh, while we were in progress, as you know, Joplin, Missouri, literally blew away. Amen. We still. And uh, so, and we had hailstones behind us, but nothing on top of us. And uh, we thank you for your prayer. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to a church that we love dearly, and we're so glad you're here. And we, we pray that, that God will speak through his word to all of us today that we will serve well. I, I want to begin by doing something a little bit foolish, maybe, and, uh, and that's okay. I, I really think that it's important that people not take themselves too seriously. Amen. Uh, when we do, we get ourselves into all kinds of difficulty and trouble. I think it's important that we that we know uh, who we are in the Lord, uh, and that we allow other people to be who they are in the Lord, uh, and love each other anyway. But uh, let me share with you uh, a little bit that I that I found on my way. I picked up a book uh, in Amarillo, Texas. It was from the Lifeway Bookstore. And uh, it uh, is entitled, I'm fine with God, but I can't stand Christians. <laughs> Let me just read you the title page, if you will. I'm fine with God, but I can't stand Christians who impose their morality on others. Amen. Chapter 2. I'm fine with God, but I can't stand Christians who are paranoid. That must have ring a bell somewhere. It's very quiet. I, I think that's a mental disorder, isn't it? I'm fine with God, but I can't stand Christians who think they are correctly right and everyone is wrongly left. I can't stand Christians who think science is the enemy. I can't stand Christians. Uh, I, I'm fine with God, but I can't stand Christians who are convinced. God wants them to be rich. I'm fine with God, but I can't stand Christians who fixate on the end of the world. I'm fine with God, but I can't stand Christians who make lousy movies. Some of you can relate to that, I think. I'm fine with God, but I can't stand Christians who don't know what they believe. That's an important chapter, I think. I haven't read it yet. It's a new book. I'm fine with God, but I can't stand Christians who think they have a monopoly on truth. I'm fine with God, but I can't stand Christians who give Christ a bad name. You remember that Mahatma Gandhi once said, I would be a Christian except for Christians. That's an indictment, folks. That's an indictment to all of us when we misbehave. And I, and I want us to know that, that God is holding us all accountable, each and every one accountable for our behavior. Let me read you a passage and then we'll get to the message in a moment. But I, I, I thought a little bit of preliminary right now. I'm reading from 1 John chapter 4, verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. 
we have come to know and believe the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Amen? Amen. Now let's get to the heart of it. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. I like that holy rustle when you're looking for a scripture. That's a good thing. Colossians 3, 12 through 17, it goes like this. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. Just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with singing, with, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Let us pray. Holy Father, we thank you for giving us permission and access to you directly. And we thank you for the Spirit's ministry within the heart and life of every true believer by giving us the directness to your grace. And we do pray, Holy God, that you would examine our hearts as we examine your word for guidance. Help us to look at our own conduct. And we pray that somehow we'll come to the point that you can approve of us, at least in some small measure. We ask you to examine our motives, which Jesus has promised to do. And that the law that was written in the negative was expanded to the positive where we are examined every time we approach you. And we pray that these words from the beloved apostle may remind us of how our Christian character should be manifest and how that we should walk before the people of the world. We ask you to forgive our many sins. We ask you to be gracious to us because we are far from perfect. And we ask you to forgive those hasty statements that have been made in abundance. Dear Lord, open our eyes and our hearts that we may know you, and in knowing you that we may know ourselves with all the faults that we have, and that we may know and love each other who may be different in some ways. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love that God has manifest to us, 
I've entitled the message today, Getting Ready for Heaven. Now, I know if we had a bus pulled up to the curb in front, that most of you would not want to pour it right now. But at the same time, all of us who know Jesus Christ one day will face the reality of God's glory. Amen. And therefore, we need to behave ourselves as heaven-bound people. Uh, and when we do not, that's a serious indictment, not only to us, but to our Lord. John reminds us that when we say we love God and hate our brother, that we lie. And that's pretty serious, isn't it? Amen. So Paul is giving us some instruction about how to conduct ourselves as believers. In chapter 3, verses 1 to 4, this is background, he talks about being in Christ. It has been said, this is not the best world, but this is the best place to prepare for the best world. We have but one opportunity. We go around only once. The Bible tells us that uh, after death, there's judgment. And we don't have to have a do-over. We cannot do it over. It simply is done and sealed at the point of death. So Paul is advising the people of Colossae to live in Christ, preparing for and seeking for a home in heaven. Now I know that it has been said and it's a kind of a uh, cliche that some people can be so heavenly minded that they're of no earthly use. Amen. And I, I realize that, that that's a, an indictment also that we become totally impractical and paranoid uh, and, and virtually without influence in the world. But there is a sense in which every believer, every person in Christ, Every individual who knows the Lord Jesus as Savior has a responsibility to behave righteously. Amen. And Paul is reminding us about where that's placed. The, the, the phrase in the New Testament, in Christ, is very significant. It's very important. When we are in Christ, that means that we have been properly associated with him by grace, that we have not earned that station, that we have no degree that qualifies us for that station, that nobody has promoted us to that level, that it is because we have been related to God through Jesus Christ and Him crucified. In Christ, we need to learn to behave ourselves as heaven-bound people. In verses 5 to 9 of that chapter, he talks about the mortal warfare with the old life of sin. If you want a more complete explanation of that, it's easy to find in Romans chapter 7. And I believe that Paul was reciting his own struggle with that life of sin. That the very thing that he would not do, just refused to do, determined never to do, he finds himself doing. That he was a living contradiction, as we all are. And it's so important that we know that because we're imperfect, that God can use imperfect people because there are no perfect ones around. As I have said recently to you, my mom used to say, God can even use a crooked stick. Amen. It's, it's very helpful to know that none of us are perfect. None of us have all the answers. None of us know all the truth. And when we come to that conclusion and that knowledge, uh, we can be more careful to be loving toward others. In verses 10 and 11, Paul talks about forming a new kind of humanity 
that shows faith in Christ in the world. And then we get to our text, verse 12 and following. I sense that our church is in a crisis time. Uh, I have been given advice from many sources since arriving home. Um, there have been many who have cautioned me about various things. Uh, there have been disturbing things that have occurred while we were away. Some people have behaved badly. And I hope that you know that and approve of that and recognize that that's true. Amen. Remember that nobody, nobody, no Christian has it all right. We're all sinners. If we have been saved, it's by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and that alone. And since we stand together in that dilemma, in that place. We need to take a look, a hard look, at what Christian character is all about. And that's where we're going today. This is going to be fairly brief, but hopefully helpful. So let's look at that, that person as he shows his Christianity to the world. The new Christian character. Every situation that we find ourselves in is a ground for us to show the stuff that we're made of. A little thing was going around when I was in college. Uh, what comes out of orange when you squeeze it? And some people say, well, orange juice. But that's in its natural state. But if something else has been injected in the arms, the stuff that's in there is what comes out, right? Amen. And so I think we need to recognize the fact that, that we have some stuff in us that oozes out sometimes embarrassingly. So every situation that we find ourselves in is an opportunity for us to as collect, elect collective group as a church of the Lord Jesus to find a Christian perspective and a correct approach to God's help. In verse 12, he says, put on compassion. Put on compassion. That does not mean be judgmental. That does not mean that we are to impose all that we believe on everybody else. But that we somehow respect God's leadership of others as we believe and depend upon His leadership of us. Isn't it wonderful that, that we as Christians believe that God communicates with all of his people? Amen. If we do not believe that, then somehow we have cut away some scripture that's very important. And so I, I challenge you to think about compassion. The next word that Paul uses is the simple word, kindness. Kindness. I've counseled a number of couples who were in trouble with their marriage through the years. I'm an old guy, I'm an old country preacher, and uh, so people have come to me with their problems at various times. And you know, one of the problems that crops up in marriages is because people are kinder to strangers than they are to their mate. Strangely, that's true. Christians ought to be kind. And when we're unkind, we leave a, a great blot on uh, our Christian influence. So Paul said, be kind. 
recognize the fact that, that you don't have it all. And then he said, he used the word humility. Now that's a tough one. I've always found it difficult to pray to God to humble us. The reason that I do is because we're warned in Scripture that that is a severe thing that God brings on us to bring humility. But we need to be humble. Not arrogant. Not proudful. Not boastful. But humble. I believe that God has placed the people of this church in this church to serve him in this area. I believe that. I believe that he can use all of us if we're willing. And if we're unwilling, then we have a deep spiritual problem in our own heart. 